So let's talk about the theory of case now with a breath test. And let's say that the government took a breath test from your client and the reading was 0.16, which is double drunk, double drunk, twice the legal limit, 0.16. How do you deal with that? You know, how, how do you address that? Well, you can't avoid it, right? You can't go under it, can't go over it. You got to go through it. You have no choice, right? Because if you avoid it, the government's certainly going to raise it, certainly going to address it. And one of the ways I suggest dealing with it, I have a, you know, a story that I use and feel free to use it for yourself. Um, I like to take the evidence and put it in its context and ask the jury not to simply look at one of the trees, but look at the whole forest. You know, there's a great story, for example, by Ed Young, and you could use this. There's lots of other types of analogies and stories. Uh, don't lose the forest for the trees. And you can come up with your own as well. I like the Ed Young story. It talks about a, 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 a mice that, you know, come out of their, their den and they find a strange object. Now the reader knows the object to be an elephant, but the, the mice don't because they're blind. And each of the, uh, the, the mice examine a different part of the elephant and they conclude it's something else. One of the, the mice examines the tail and concludes the object must be a rope. The next mice examines the uh, mouse, examines the leg and concludes the object must be a tree. And each of the mice examines a different part of the elephant, concluding the object is something other than an elephant. But it's the last mouse that examines the whole, every part of the elephant. That mouse examines the leg the trunk, everything, the tail. And then that mouse realizes because he's looked at the hole that the elephant in fact is an elephant. And the mouse moral of the story is knowing in part may make a fine, fine tail, but true wisdom comes from seeing the hole. In a DWI case, I like to ask jurors to make sure that they don't only look at the single piece of the elephant, but they must look at the hole. Looking at the hole is important in a DWI case. You have to put the evidence in its context, and it's within that context that you, you develop the rest of your case. Now, what is that context? What is the rest of it that you have to point them to? Aha. You have to find something. It's what I call the hook, okay? We're going to get to that in a second. But before you know what the hook is, you have to have some knowledge so that you could find the hook, right? Right? You know, it's just not simply credible to sit there and attack the machine and say that this breath testing device is a piece of crap. You can't do that. First of all, the jury instructions say you can't do that. Uh, the jury instructions actually say that the people do not have to introduce any scientific testimony that the device itself is a reliable instrument. So that's not really going to help you. Um, so you really have to know the science. You have to have some understanding of the science. Now, there's something else I want you to consider here before we hop into the science and move to the second phase of our conversation today, which is the actual science. I want to talk to you for a minute about this principle of, of getting the jury's trust and also realizing that there is a presumption of guilt in a DWI case with a breath test. You have to understand that. Now, I know what you're saying. I went to law school. There's a presumption of innocence. It's in the Constitution. I don't care because until you've sat in that jury room, that courtroom during jury selection and heard the judge tell the jury for the first time that the charge is DWI and watch them as they go and looked at your client with that scornful look, he's guilty from the moment they hear the charge. So why is that? That's because most of society has preconceived biases. We all do. If I was to ask you all right now, and I'll do it right now. I mean, we can't interact in this medium, so we won't be able to have the follow-up, but I'm going to ask you all right now to think of a red fruit. Go ahead. Think of a red fruit. I'll give you a few seconds. Are you thinking of it? Okay. Most of you probably said apple. And you're shaking your head. How did I know that? Let me ask you a question. What's wrong with strawberries? What's wrong with raspberries? What's wrong with cherries? Are you guys prejudiced against cherries and strawberries and raspberries? The reality is you just had a preconceived bias because you associate a red fruit with an apple and you associate somebody who's given a breath test and the machine has registered the result with that result being accurate. 
So what you must do is you must figure out a way to get somebody to understand that those preconceived biases might be wrong and we need to talk about how you do that. So before you teach somebody, you have to first build a new belief system. And this slide right here is very important. I highly recommend that you pay attention to this slide and this is gonna be very useful for you in any case that you deal with in your future experience, whether this is you know, you're handling a sexual assault case, you're handling a rape case, you're handling any case involved dealing with somebody with preconceived biases. And this is also very helpful actually in your everyday lives when you're just dealing with people that might have preconceived biases. It's a three-step process. Number one, you have to acknowledge there's a preconceived notion. That's number one. Two, you have to link the client and yourself to it. And number three, you have to use that link to build the new belief system. So let me give you a real example in a DWI case. You know, Johnny Walker came into my office and the first day he came into my office, Johnny said to me that when he blew into the box, the machine, the number that came out of the machine, the result was a 0.16, double the legal limit. And of course, when I saw that, I said to Johnny Walker, well, if the machine blew a 0.16, then you're double drunk. What are we going to do? There's nothing we could do to defend you. And, you know, Johnny and I looked at that and said, wow, you know, you're, you know, you're right, Mr. Epstein. Don't, that's, that's, that's really going to be difficult. Uh, and that's, that's obviously very strong evidence. But you know what happened? When we started looking at the discovery in the case and we looked at the machine's maintenance records and the way the machine was kept up and most importantly, the way that the machine was used that day, the procedures that the police used to operate the machine, that's when we realized that the machine wasn't used properly and the results were inaccurate and wrong. And that preconceived notion that I had that the machine was right was just wrong and I never should have done that. You just can't tell people they're wrong. You have to take them through that process. So let's talk about um, the hook. Let's go back to the science a little bit. You know, you can't just challenge the device so that you have to find the hook. And in order to find the hook or, or what the reason was that the machine wasn't right that day, right? You can't just say breath testing is wrong. The machine generally doesn't work. You have to associate it somehow with something. So, um, you know, what you can do in a good place to start is look at the jury instructions in New York. Because the jury instructions, the judge actually tells the jury, you must consider, must, that's the language, must consider how the main machine was maintained and how the machine was operated, whether it was in proper operating uh, condition that day and whether the machine was properly operated that day. So that's the language that you have to look at in the jury instruction. And that's where you build your case. That's where you find your hook. How do you as a lawyer know then what went wrong if you don't understand something about breath testing? And that's where we're gonna go now.